How are y'all doing? Good morning in Focus Church. What, a, what an absolute honor uh, to be with y'all. Again, this is my second time here. Uh, and this time, last time I brought my whole family. This time, uh, I just brought my son, Liam, and he's in the front row. Can we give it up for Liam? In the... He was so excited to be here. He told me, Dad, uh, I packed my Air Force Ones in a separate bag just to be here. And so uh, I'm so happy to be able to do ministry with my son. If y'all have your Bibles, you can open up to Psalm 121. We're going to work through this psalm together. Um, I want to thank Pastor Brent and Carla and the entire team here at InFocus for uh, trusting me with this time together. And I have an idea, Pastor Brent. Brent, I didn't, I didn't say this to you before. But I realize every time I come here that the worship, the lyrics are so powerful. And I almost have this feeling that we just need to call an audible. And instead of going through the text, we just need to have like a couple moments where we sing a song, then stop and unpack the theology of the lyrics that we're singing. So maybe that's an idea for some time. Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, Psalm 121, let's pray. Lord, you're so kind. Um, I'm just thinking about those words that, that, uh, that you have never lost a, a battle, that you are our strong tower, that, 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 that you're a great mountain. Yes. And, and Lord, as we sing these truths about you, I echo the prayer of Pastor Robert earlier. Holy Spirit, would you engage our hearts? Would you beat our hearts alive to the rhythm of your spirit? Would you engage our minds with the beauty of your word? And Lord, would you equip our bodies to act in light of what we feel and what we know to be true in a world that is desperate for your truth and your goodness? Jesus, we trust you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Um, so we're in Psalm 121, but um, you saw a quick picture up there of my family. We've got three little boys, Liam, Levi, and Lucas. They're not so little anymore. 10, 8, and 7. And, and two years ago, y'all, uh, we thought that we were just going to be an all-boy family, you know? And, uh, and, and that was kind of the thought. And then uh, my wife and I, we were expecting our fourth. And, and I was 100% convinced that this fourth child was going to be another boy. God has designed our family to be a boy family. I know what to do with boys. Roughhouse and Russell, like, like I got the boy thing down. My wife knows how to be a boy mom. And so we just thought, hey, like it's, it's, it's boy time. We got this, right? And then we did one of those like uh, unveiling, you know, things. And I'm like, this is silly. Why do we even need to unveil? I heard directly from the Holy Spirit. We're about to have another boy. We don't need another unveiling. And, and so um, my wife had this thought that we'll just have a friend who's going to fill up a balloon. And in that balloon, there will be like, you know, either blue or pink to represent the boy or the girl. And so my boys were going to throw darts at the balloon. Now, not those fake darts with the plastic tips, but the real darts with the metal tips, a little dangerous, right? And then we realized that we kind of messed up the whole thing because we had nowhere to to put the balloon up. And so guess who became uh, the person who held the balloon up? Dad became the person who, and at that point I just thought, Lord, please give my boys the gift of accuracy because if one of these darts hits me, it's gonna be over, right? And so they threw it and they all missed the first round, but we all have warm-ups. It's okay, Liam, It's it's all good. And then the second one, all three, Three of them hit, because they threw at the same time. Another bad idea. They threw them all at the same time and hit the balloon. Y'all, I, we have this on Instagram. The, the balloon exploded, and it was pink. My, the, there was sh- There's one clap. Okay, cool. <laughs> Like the shock on my face, you can see it on this Instagram. I I was shook, I didn't, to the point when MJ was born, I still didn't believe that it was gonna be a girl. And I was like, Doc, can you just check one more time? Like, is this, and it was actually a girl. And so we have been on a different journey. We are now uh, an all boy plus one baby girl family. 
And so my kids have always had kind of different things that they're super into. They've, they've had blankies and, and the little tags, you know, that, that at the end of the blankies. And they've had um, little uh, stuffed animals uh, that they've had. Uh, I, Liam, because you're the only one here, I'm just going to pick on, on Liam. Liam had this little black toothless dragon thing. You all know toothless? Remember toothless? Yeah. He had this tooth. Man, it, toothless had to be with him no matter what. Uh, but MJ has a different thing. And her thing is called, in our house, we call it a puggy. Does anybody know what a puggy is? No. Uh, another word for it is known as a pacifier. A pacifier, right? So it's this little thing. I, I wish I brought one with me. It, it's a little, little device. I don't know who designed this device, but whoever designed it should be sainted because it's an incredible little device that the baby puts into their mouth and, and they start to sign, and it gives comfort. It gives security. Uh, it's just this incredible thing. And so Emmy is now talking a little bit. She can't say puggy, so she calls it her papa. Her papa. And, and we're doing, you know, working hard. We're like pro parents now with, with four kids, and we know that there's gonna come a time when we've gotta take the papa away from her, and, and, and things are not gonna be well for our family in that season. And so we're like, hey, we're just going to do a, a slow drip withdrawal, right? And so no papa all day, every day, but, but at specific times. And, and we're finally at that stage where the papa only comes out in the last couple hours of the day, at least that's the goal, right? And, and it sets her up for success for when she needs to go to bed. This is the routine every night. It gets to the point where it's bedtime. My wife and I rock, paper, scissors to see who's going to put the baby down to bed. I typically always win, but you know, sometimes we lose. And so when I lose, I've got the baby and we do the, the whole nine yards, the shower, the bath, the, you know, all, all of it. And, and then we get to the same time every moment right before bed. And, and we ask this question because the baby's staring at us and we say, Where's the papa? How in the world does this child have the papa know exactly where it is like throughout the entire day? And yet, in the two minutes right before we lay her down for bed, the papa is nowhere to be found. <laughs> and then it's panic. It's panic time, right? Because she looks at us and she knows that we do not have the papa. And so she looks at me first and she goes, Daddy, papa? And I'm panicking, and I look at my wife, Britt, and I go, babe, papa? <laughs> and, and MJ looks at me and then looks to my wife, and she goes, mama, papa? And at this point, we're all panicking, and we all yell simultaneously, Liam, Levi, Lucas, papa? And at this point, all three boys scramble. It's like a scramble drill. And they go throughout the house, and, and you can watch MJ if you just look at her eyes. You'll watch her. And she, and she goes from, is dad going to help me? Nah. Is mom going to help me? No. My brothers must be the help that I need. And she will scan the field to see if Liam is close. Nope. Is Levi close? Nope. And then the hero of the story comes into the picture. The youngest son, my little bear, Lucas. And he walks with a little bit of a swagger. And he's got that papa behind his back. And he lifts it up almost like it's a diamond ring, y'all. <laughs> and he gives it to MJ. And MJ grabs it and goes... Papa, I found you. <laughs> now we all know MJ didn't do no finding at all. She just had all of us peons go out and look for everything for her, and she got the papa. But, but notice what MJ did. She, she was looking for help, right? And she looked to the sources of help. Dad, nah. Mom, mm -mm. Liam, not this time. Levi, maybe next time. Today, it's Lucas is my help. What MJ models in that moment is I think the position of life that we've all experienced at one time or another. Have you ever wondered, have you ever asked the question, where is my help? In moments of tragedy, where is my help? In moments of uncertainty, where is my help? In moments of frustration and anger, where is my help? 
We turn to Psalm 121, and it's a series of 15 psalms that starts in Psalm 120, and I'm like an academic theologian, so I got to get into the, the background a little bit with y'all, and so just bear with me, but these psalms are called Psalms of Ascent, and they have a rich history, and there are two major thoughts of, of, of how these psalms were used in the life of the people of God. The Mishnah, this almost commentary on the Old Testament, it, it draws a parallel between the 15 psalms and the 15 steps to get into the temple in Jerusalem. Gosh, can you imagine being the people of God? Getting ready to go into the house of God. And yet, in a culture that just wants to get in the doors as fast as that we can, if you're at Disney, you get the VIP deal. It's worth every dollar, right? Notice the, the, the way the people of Israel construct how to enter into the house of God. The thought was that at every step that they would take, they would stop and sing Psalm 120. And then the next step in Psalm 121. And the next step in Psalm 122. In 15 steps with 15 songs. And there's a, another thought that's even more ancient that these were songs that were sung as a, a pilgrimage to Israel, because remember, people lived all over the place. And so they would sing these songs on their way, journeying back to the temple. Now, now, why is this background important? I don't know about you, but y'all have any songs that you listen to, it comes on the radio, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, that is a blast from the past. Yeah. Hmm? For me, I was actually, I was, uh, we're in the car and I, I played a couple of those, those songs and those bands. So, you know, I, I don't want y'all to think less of me, but you know, we're all high school, junior high at one point in time. And so there was this band, I don't know, Caleb, if you know this band, called Taking Back Sunday. I don't know. Oh my gosh. Love, boy, okay. So I played, the, I played the band to my son and he looked at me and he was like, dad, this is horrible. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I've got these memories of being like an emo kid sitting there. I just broke up with a girlfriend and I'm like, listen to the same depression pressing song over and over and over. I'm like, what do you mean? This is so great. He's like, dad, that sounds horrible. Or there's another song by John Mayer. It's called something about the halls of my high school. I'm not good with titles, but you know, running through the halls of my high school. I know, I know exactly what is taking place, where I was when I heard that song. There's some newer songs by a guy named Ben Rector that bring up a lot of emotion for me. One of them is old friends. You can't make old friends. You ever thought about that? Another one is uh, the men who drive me places. He tells the story of these people that would pick him up. Songs have a powerful way of stirring up emotions and bringing back memories that locate us in a particular time, in a particular place to bring about remembrance. So as we enter into Psalm 121, I want to make this suggestion that this isn't just a psalm. I want you to think about this as a song. And here's what this song is intended to do. These are songs of remembrance intended to reframe the mind, orient the heart, and direct the steps of the people of God. In other words, these songs, particularly Psalm 121, it's aimed at the whole person. It deals with who we are as human beings. So I want to just read through the entire psalm once. It's not bad. It's just 215 verses. I'm playing. It's not. Eight verses. Let's read. Psalm 121. This is what the psalmist said, a, psalm, a song of ascent. I, I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber nor sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. 
The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forever. And so we start here with this very first big idea. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the one who holds all power and all authority. The psalmist starts this way. He says, I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? You see, we live in a, in a time where we just want to get to the meaning of the psalm and we bypass the, the beginning verses because these words just kind of seem familiar to us. You know what I mean? Like it's easy on the surface to be like, oh yeah, absolutely. Where's my help? The mountains. The mountains is where my help's going to come from. Great song. Let's put it on a worship deal and we'll be good. We'll just sing it, smack it on a coffee cup, right? Is this what the original audience that people of Israel would have thought of when they heard these words. No. There's something that's happening behind the scenes in the Hebrew context that I want to bring to light. You see, the people of Israel were called to be a holy people, which meant that they were set apart for a purpose. That's what holiness is. It's not set apart to be in isolation as an individualized community that is a monastic society that runs to the hills and hide. No. To be holy is to be a a people set apart uh, with a purpose to reflect and and image and and to share the goodness and greatness of the great king of the cosmos. That's the idea, right? Now, what does that mean? It means that you're not running away from the culture. You're running into the culture. Woo, hold up, wait a minute. How can we be a people who are holy and set apart, but smack within? The people of Israel dealt with this issue consistently. This is why all throughout the Old Testament, we read these warnings from Yahweh, from God. Yahweh is the intimate name of God. It signifies his intimate relationship with his people. Beware of the nations that surround you. Beware of the false gods that are around you. Have nothing to do with them. But interestingly, the way that the Old Testament law was set up was set up so that those nations could actually be invited to become part of the people of God. So the expectation is this. You don't be like them. No, you set a visible example of what it looks like to be a family of God and invite them to be like you. Oh my goodness, you see what I'm saying? So the people of Israel are wondering, they're in the middle of of oppression and maybe there's a famine. Maybe it's not rained for a long period of time. Today it's very easy for us, it doesn't rain, no worries. Turn on the tap, we got water that comes out, right? In the ancient world it doesn't rain, it's a big deal. And they're thinking, is God angry? with us, why is there no rain? Like, like how are the crops gonna grow? How are we gonna get water for our families? Interestingly, the people of Israel, as they would have been out and about, there is a, a difference between hills and mountains. And they would look up, and at times, the pagan nations around them would have set up altars for pagan gods on the hills around them. And so maybe it's the altar for Molech. Maybe it's the altar for Dagon. Maybe it's the altar for Baal, the the, the thunder god, the fertility god. You see all the different issues that we have in life? There There were altars for them. And what were they set up? On the mountains. Now let's go back. Let's read this. What does it say? I lift my eyes towards the mountains. Where will my help come from? Here's what I actually think that the psalmist is doing. I think the psalmist, y'all, is subtweeting. I really do. I'm going to prove it through the rest of the text, by the way. You see, I think this is actually an accusation against the people of God for their tendency to look for counterfeit helpers. Oh, it looks good. Man, Baal looks good. (laughs) He, if you, if you just look at the, at the, at the sight test, the eyesight test, Baal passes it. What about the substance test? And this is what the psalmist is asking. And then he goes, where? Where, where will my help come from? Will it come from Baal? Will it come from Marduk? Will it come from these, these, these counterfeit gods? Verse two, 
He gives you the answer. No. My help comes from the Lord. And notice the distinction of who the Lord is. Again, simple words that we read all the time, but we need to read them in context of what's taking place. The maker, the creator of heaven and earth. It's the one who made the mountains that our help comes from. You see, uh, there is a very serious danger that presents itself in the space between looking down and lifting our eyes upward. Let's just do that for for a second, right? Look down at your feet, and now look up, upward. That space, that distance, the small space of lifting our gaze, listen, we are presented with hundreds of temptations that are distractions that try to deviate us from fixing our gaze upon God and ultimately will derail us from the source of our true help. Huh. I'm feeling not super great about myself. I would love for people to like me and to affirm who I am as a person, as an individual. It'd be great to get a couple pats on my back for the work that I've done, for the effort that I've put in my family or in my vocation. I'm depressed, where's my help gonna come from? Huh, Instagram, I just got 25 likes. Whoo, boy! There's a lot of psychology actually behind Instagram and social media and the dopamine hits that we get every time the Instagram like notifications hit you for the picture that you posted. Counterfeit help. I'm so tired of of feeling insecure, of of not having position and and status, and and it would be just so nice if I could grab that new Tesla, y'all. You know, gas prices are rough right now. Tesla would be nice. Money, it's a counterfeit helper. It can create a sense of security as if it could position us in a place of power. Where do I belong? Where do I locate myself in relationship with all the people around me? Do I find my belonging in my family as the oldest, as the youngest, as the mom, as the dad? Is that the thing that that fills my identity? as the employee or the employer at work in my position or my title or my educational accomplishments. It's a counterfeit helper. You see, our God gives us a different answer for all of these counterfeit helps. God tells us that the king of the cosmos knows us intimately because he created and knows every hair on our head. So, because he knows us, he invites us to know him. The king of the cosmos, God, he he tells us that any sense of security or position or power can only be found in the one who creates all things and sustains all things through Christ Jesus, his son. God tells us, no, 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 I'm going to bring together a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational family of God that looks so odd and so uncomfortable to the entire world that the only answer for the way that they come together is the power of the Holy Spirit that knit them together. But God assures us that we are children, sons and daughters of the king of the universe. And if you're a son or a daughter of the king of the universe, it is impossible, listen to me, it is impossible to be inferior or lacking. Because when the world sees us, they should see the wisdom of God, Jesus. We have to really consider, what are those counterfeit helpers? that are promising the world to us, but delivering destruction. Verses two through four. So we talked about that, the the maker of heaven and earth. Now you're wondering, Joel, I need you to prove some of this stuff, because I always thought that just the the mountains, that's where our our help comes from, that's what the words say. No worries, I got y'all. 
He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. So here's our uh, our second point. Our helper is not only near, but he is always aware. You see, I actually think what's happening is he's continuing his strategy, the psalmist, of subtweeting. And this time, his reference point is actually 1 Kings 18, 27 through 29. Just, just a heads up, when we're reading scripture, scripture is meant to be interconnected with each other. There's often times that we'll begin to hear echoes of other stories, and, and the biblical author is being inspired by the Holy Spirit to, to make these divine connections. Let's read 1 Kings 18, 27 through 29. It's about this prophet named Elijah. And I kind of just love the way the CSB says it. At noon, Elijah mocked them. Now, kids, don't be running around mocking people. But if your name is Elijah, I guess you can do it. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, and he said, shout loudly, for, for he's a God. Remember, this is uh, at the top of this mountain where there's this competition between who the real God is. Shout loudly, for he's a God. Maybe he's thinking it over. They're talking about Baal. I just, can, I just love the language. And I can think of Elijah like this, hey, y'all, it's okay. Maybe Baal's wandered away. <laughs> He's, he might be on the road, on a journey. Oh, you know what, I, I figured it out. Maybe he's just sleeping and he'll wake up. And so the, the priests of Baal, the prophets of Baal, they shout loudly. Because if your God is asleep, You want him to pay attention. They'll do whatever it takes to get him to pay attention. So they cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom, the details of the text, until blood gushed over them. And all afternoon, y'all, they kept on raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice. And these are some of the most haunting words of the text if you are a follower of Baal. But there was no sound. No one answered. No one paid attention. Psalm 121 3. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. He's not like Baal, he's not taking a nap. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber nor sleep. It's a, it's a repetition. You see, I think sometimes we go, man, look at those, those followers of Baal. How, how, how could they do that? Don't they know that ain't nobody listening? They're just bleeding out and nobody's got any first aid kits. What is going on? And I think about our stories and the way we've been at times trained to think about our God. Well, Maybe if I just do all the right things, God will love me. Maybe if I just show up at all the church things, God will take notice. Well, maybe if, if, if I look good, if I look right, if I act and, and do all the things that, that we're supposed to do, maybe that will earn God's affection for me. And I just want to be real with y'all right now. And then what happens when you get the diagnosis you never thought you would ever get? Is God asleep and slumbering? What happens when your kids go through the most horrific situations in school and the anxiety and the stress and and you don't have the the wisdom to, to navigate it, but you're like, I've done all the right things. God, did you wander away and walk away? Are you asleep? Are you gone? This is a real tension, and I don't want us to hide from it. There is no wrap a a bow around it and tie it together and be like, oh, you're good. Go ahead and and grab your your lunch on Sunday at your favorite spot. I don't have a perfect solution for you, but I do have what the text tells us right after this. That one, he's near. He's near. His presence is with us, which means his power is evident in us. And what if, I just want to pose this question, 
What if the intent isn't for you to get around those things or to run away from those things or to never experience those things, but to actually be equipped to get through those things? It's hard, y'all. But here's what I'm convinced of. God is more concerned with who you are and who you will be through the journey than just getting you by the skin of your teeth at the end of the journey. And then we're left with some pretty incredible reminders. It's a theology of remembrance. The second, the the third point, our, our helper, he's also our protector. Verses five through eight, the the Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forever. Here is the the solution. Here is the response that, that God does give us in the moments of our plight, in the moments of our tragedy, in the moments of our turmoil when we don't know what's going on. Here, here's his response. The response is remember. Remember who I am, who I was, who I will be, and how that those truths will impact the present right now. You need a reminder of who I am. Notice the language of this. I'm going to protect you by day. I'm going to protect you by night. The context is the wilderness journey of the people of Israel as they were escaping Pharaoh. During the day, the heat could have killed them. I mean, y'all ever been in the blazing heat in the Middle East? It ain't no fun. In India, you never find people going out in the middle of the day, like one o'clock, two o'clock, let's go out for a walk. Ain't happening. Nobody's doing that. They're, they're, They're taking a nap or having some chai. During the day, the heat could have killed people, but what does the text say? That Yahweh is the shade that protects them from death. And during the night in the wilderness, the most vicious animals come out. The snakes and the scorpions and and these venomous, murderous animals. During the night, the wild animals are out. But Yahweh is the shelter that the people hide in that protects us from the enemies who desire us death. You ever thought about this? Think about a tree. A blazing hot day, right? And you look around and it's hot everywhere. But there's this one tree, it's a big old oak tree, massive with branches, it's been there forever. And underneath that oak tree, there's this shade. What is the human impulse in a hot day? Where do you go? To the shade. Have you ever thought about what it's like to sit underneath the shade? And consider the cost for the shade. (laughs) We don't, I don't, because I'm like, I got the shade, why do I care about the cost? Does the sun stop shining in that spot? Nah. What happens? The tree takes the brunt end of the blazing heat and absorbs it so that the tree can provide the shade. You and I, friends, this is the promise. This is what the psalmist is leading us to. We are in the shade of the grace of Jesus Jesus, who hung on a cross on behalf of us. Jesus, who on the cross took the full brunt of sin and death and pain and turmoil and tragedy and dysfunction, all of it, he absorbed it onto himself and defeated death through death. Jesus is the shade of grace that we experience protects us from a greater enemy from sin and death. You see, in life we have two realities, the immediate and the eternal. And here's my suggestion, that the promise of the Messiah is to be with us to process through the immediate. But how do, we, what, how do we do that? Like, how do we get to the other side? It's the hope of the eternal. And the hope of the eternal is the reunification of the family of God with the Father. 
I love that song that we sang. The one line said that he's never lost a battle. But I want to tell you all something. The disciples, when they see Jesus hung on a cross, they're thinking not only is the battle lost, the war is lost. But in that moment, what looked like a severe loss was the presence of the most epic victory. I want to end with Spurgeon because there are those of us that are desperate for help and, and we've got this immediate thing that's happening. We need to be reminded that God is outside of time and outside of space and he cares for you in the right now. He cares for you in the right now. And he's working in a thousand ways that we cannot see. This is how Spurgeon encourages us. What you and I need, what we need is help. Help, powerful, efficient, constant. We need a a very present help in trouble. What a mercy that we have it in our God. Our hope is in Jehovah, for our help comes from him. You and I are all pilgrims on a road, on a journey. And this is what he says. Help is on the road and will not fail to reach us in due time. For he who sends it to us was never known to be too late. Lord, where does our help come from? It comes from the one who created the mountains. It comes from the one who sustains creation. It comes from the one who hung on the cross and took the full brunt of sin and death and pain and turmoil so that we could live a life reunited with God. Jesus, we thank you that you are our true help. And God, we pray that your spirit would teach us to identify counterfeit helps and to reject those so that we can place our hope and faith in the one true help. And his name is Jesus. Amen.